Unfortunately, uh, I misunderstood what Nick was going to talk about, and our presentations are very similar, actually. Um, I thought that Nick was going to be giving a lot of tools from his amazing book, Change of Heart, and so I prepared a presentation almost exclusively on supporting people in their vegan paths and uh, <laughs> on the uh, fact that three-fourths of people uh, become ex-vegetarians who try vegetarianism. Uh, so I think I might try to use my slideshow as a guide while actually uh, just kind of telling little anecdotes that I've learned um, along the way using the principles that I had in here. Uh, so I apologize if it's a little bit wonky, but otherwise I would just be giving a really similar presentation to Nick, and I don't think that would be the best use of anyone's time. I think that a improvised presentation is better than a repeat presentation, probably. Um, but for those who don't know, and I'm sure you've seen me way too many times on the stage already, uh, I'm Michael Leverman, the Executive Director of Farm Animal Rights Movement. <laughs> And I was going to start out, I'll still tell the little tale anyway, even though Nick's talk covered very similar ground. Um, but I was on my Facebook recently, and there is a friend of mine who went vegan uh, largely because of my influence um, when we were in college. And I saw that she had posted something about getting uh, a latte with cow's milk for the first time in like 10 years. And I was a little disappointed. And I thought, you know, yeah, I actually... My wife and I have a thing now, we sing the song Another One Bites the Dust by Queen uh, every time we see something like this happen. And so I, I opened my Facebook and I just started humming, dun, 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 she's like, oh god, who was it this time? Uh, I'm not going to say the name. Not that anyone here would know who it was. But um, anyway, I thought, you know, like Nick showed earlier with the fact that dairy is only a small percentage of the suffering, I thought, that sucks, not the end of the world. Uh, then a few weeks later, uh, she posted a picture of herself eating uh, sushi with, uh, with, with fish in it. And said the same thing, like, oh, first time eating sushi in such a long time with real fish that it's amazing. And then, like, a week later, she said, everyone, I took the plummet, I tried bacon for the first time, and the hipsters are right, it's the most amazing thing I've ever had in my entire life. I can't believe I've been missing this for the last ten years. And then she changed her Instagram name to, like, Paleo Princess or something like that. Um, and so this is an extreme example, obviously. Uh, this is someone, unlike, uh, you know, Nick had said that fortunately the majority of ex-vegetarians fortunately still eat less meat. This is someone, I, I'm guessing she eats way more meat than she ever did before, actually, unfortunately. Uh, but I think it's a telling example uh, of this trend. And I, uh, I have this, I originally, when I would see these, I assumed that I was just seeing them because it's what I didn't want to see. You know how we do that sometimes? Like you see four friends become ex-vegan and you think everyone's going ex-vegan these days. I assumed it wasn't this widespread trend. I actually have a little, also a little inside joke with my wife about that. When I perceive, when we perceive something that's not really true, we call it the, uh, the umbrella effect. Which is, you know when it's raining and you say, God, every time it's raining I forget my umbrella. And it's like, that's not true. You forget your umbrella on days it doesn't rain all the time. And you, and you have your umbrella when it does rain all the time. You just only notice it when you forget your umbrella and it doesn't rain. So I assumed this ex-vegan trend was actually the umbrella effect. I assumed I just happened to notice every time someone went ex-vegan and it wasn't that big of a deal. Unfortunately, like Nick said, it actually is a big deal. Uh, there, I, I, this was first alerted to me, and I believe possibly Nick as well. I know you were emailing about this a lot a few years ago. Um, when the psychologist Hal Herzog uh, put an article out, uh, it was called, Why Do Most Vegetarians Go Back to Eating Meat? And he went on to write this article, and in it, he said that according to a 2005 study by CBS, uh, three times as many Americans, like Nick said, admit to being ex-vegetarians than describe themselves as current vegetarians, suggesting that 75% of people who quit eating meat change their minds. And I, I thought, okay, just some CBS story. And as the more you look at it, this three-fourths number has been consistently uh, verified. And it's always right around three-fourths, between 70 and like 78%. And... So Farm uh, developed uh, a kind of strategy that we're calling sustained vegan advocacy. And what we're looking at doing is how, when addressing these, these hows, how we can actually kind of have a long-term nurturing process with people's attempts uh, to, to go vegetarian or vegan. And so the first piece, and this might be not relevant to everyone's work in this room, so a lot of us are doing things like leafleting, where you really don't have a lifelong engagement with this person. You just kind of have the best way to you know, reach them in a short amount of time. And that's totally fine. 
But uh, for those of us who have the means to try this, uh, something that we're doing is it's like a three-step process, and it starts with capturing an audience. And that means finding an audience that you can kind of tell the full story to, the full message to, rather than someone who you're hoping they're going to see your message and take it home and run with it. And so I'm a huge fan of leafleting, I'm a huge fan of the uh, online video campaigns, um, and those, those are all great, but I think there's something to be said for attempting activism also, where we aren't just hoping they're going to watch the full video or hoping they're going to read most of the leaflet, but finding ways to actually get the audience in a way that they can't really leave, like this. I mean, you could, but it'd be kind of awkward, right? Uh, the little tool I use for myself is I try to find uh, what I call find the bored people or find people with nothing better to do than hear your message. Um, so one really easy way to do that is to offer little incentives for someone to watch your entire message. I'm guessing, has everyone in this room heard of the pay-per-view uh, outreach method? So, so I don't think paying someone a dollar to watch a video would be worth it in of itself. If it was just paying them to watch a video, that'd be kind of stupid, because like Nick said, you could pay 15 cents and get someone to watch a video. Um, but I think what makes offering incentives to watch videos uh, in their entirety worth it is if you can collect an email address and go through a follow-up process uh, with these people. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit, but another example is giving presentations, like classroom presentations. I know there was just recently a study done on vegan classroom presentations that uh, said that they're actually not particularly effective. Uh, I was not able to analyze that in depth and uh, yet I, I take some issue with it though. I think part of that is because that study wasn't assuming a long-term follow-up process afterward and again I don't think a classroom presentation is really worth it if you're not collecting everyone's email addresses afterward and doing some sort of follow-up. I mean spending an hour and a half talking to 30 people when you could leave with a thousand people in that same time doesn't really make any sense unless you know you're going to try to develop this relationship with those people afterward. And so I think that if you want to explore kind of this sustained vegan advocacy process, it's worth getting captive audiences who are willing to kind of ask questions back and give you something to follow up with them uh, with. Um, with that, obviously, it's, no, it's not worth getting a captive audience if you're not going to engage effectively. I don't need to spend a lot of time on this because I know that the restrictor after me is going to have 12 minutes up on basically the most effective ways you could possibly engage with people to get them to want to take steps towards the vegan path. Uh, I just want to say that one thing that I have noticed uh, also about this incentive-based process is it often takes people a few minutes to break down the barrier and find it worth it to really engage with the message. What I mean by that is, uh, for instance, before we were offering people a dollar to watch a four-minute video, we would just have laptops on tables all the time at festivals, uh, showcasing you know, animal farming footage uh, and outward to the, you know, to the audience. And uh, it usually, does this mic move? Uh, it used to look something like this. Can I just open your laptop and pretend that I'm watching a video on it? So the person would walk by. They'd walk by, they'd look. Huh. I'll, I'll, I'll look at you guys. It looks like this. They'd cross their arms. Their body language would go back. And about 15 seconds later, they would walk right away. And that's what I saw almost every single time that I've ever tried to show video footage in person to someone before we started offering them a dollar. Uh, since we started offering people a dollar to watch the video, 96% of them watched the entire video. Only 4% walked away. And the body language looks something like this. For the first 15 seconds, they cross their arms, they get a gross look on their face, and their body language goes back. And it remains like that for about 60 to 90 seconds. And then after that, you see this switch. And they go from this, to this, to this, to this. And it's like a four-step process that wouldn't have happened if they only had 30 seconds or so to watch this footage. They have to be forced to watch 90 seconds before they'll watch four minutes, if that makes sense. And the dollar, you know, whatever the incentive, we use online incentives too, so we also run online ads, and we say get a 1 in 25 chance of winning free movie tickets if you watch this four minute video. It doesn't really matter what the incentive is. Anything to get them to not shut down when they first see that heinous act of cruelty, when they see that first spurt of blood, or that first, you know, caged hand, or that, or that first, you know, mutilated pig testicle, to make them not walk away when they see that, and instead to want to engage with you and actually uh, learn about the subject matter. 
Uh, other than that, I'm going to skip my engaging effectively tips because I think that Bruce is going to cover them way better than I will. I just wanted to put one little plug for the idea that sometimes uh, it's worth getting something to kind of break down that first wall. Um, and the main thing I want to talk about, though, is the final piece, which is actually cultivating this compassion. And cultivating compassion, the compassion choices of the people, I think is, as Nick was saying, is really the frontier of the movement right now. Our movement can't just give people the lies and walk away and hope they're going to make changes. We have evidence to say that people aren't doing that. And so a few of my tips were totally covered. I'm probably just going to blast right through them. So one of them, obviously, is to make vegan eating easy and familiar. Sorry about that. Um, and I think that, you know, the Beyond uh, Diet what do you call that? The duo of Beyond Chicken and Beyond Eggs are the best thing our movement has to offer in this. I mean, the fact that literally publications, you know, and nothing to do with veganism, are calling them so good, better than the real thing, that they're going to freak you out, is huge awesome news for veganism. That's a, that's a huge number one, because like Nick said, taste is the number one uh, concern that people have. We just did a survey of uh, the people that watch our video afterward. We basically said anyone that pledged anything. So 80% of our viewers pledged to go vegan at least one day a week. Um, and we said anyone that pledged, just want to take like a long survey, 10 minute survey, we'll pay you a few bucks. And we had them tell us all about their lives basically. Their social media habits, their, the way that they eat, whether they live with their family or not with their family, kind of everything about this demographic. And we actually found the next biggest concern with our specific college demographic that most of us are talking about with vegan eating. The next biggest concern actually uh, by far, maybe even bigger than taste, was affordability. And it's silly, we know it's silly. We know these same people are going to run up a $40 bar tab that night and then complain <laughs> that the veggie burger costs a dollar more than the meat burger. You know, we know that's ridiculous, but... Oh, am I really told the answer already? Okay. Um, can I do 15? I think Eric did 16, right? So I'll do 15. Sure. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks for the note, though. I did not realize I was there. This says eight minutes on it. Oh, my first slide didn't time, I guess. I thought I was only at eight minutes. It's a bummer. Um, so we found that the affordability was a big one. One thing we're learning, it doesn't matter if we know it's a real concern. It matters that they think it's a concern. If people think that veganism is not affordable, even if we know it is, it doesn't matter if we know it's not. If we know it is affordable. It matters they perceive vegan eating as affordable. And so it's really important, really, really important, when reaching out to young people, college students, people at rock concerts, that we really emphasize that being vegan can be very affordable and, uh, and familiar. Of course, the health is a concern. I have found that this power plate has been, at least in classroom talks when I can actually interact with people, so, so beneficial to say the USDA itself replaced... Is there, is there a... Oh, there's no... Uh, no oh. The USDA itself took meat off the food pyramid, replaced it with protein. That is such a huge thing to tell... Yeah, you can clap for that. That the USDA said that we don't need meat to get protein. They took dairy off the plate, kind of put it on the side, and they said that fortified soy and nut milks count as dairy now. So the food pyramid is basically a vegan food plate now, and, and people I have found respond so, so well to that. Uh, the fact that a source, that I can basically tell them, the USDA is the least animal-friendly entity in the entire country in many ways. Uh, they enable the killing of 10 billion animals every single year, and they're saying that the food pyramid is basically vegan now. Uh, the last one I want to touch on briefly is just to say that, oh, that slide didn't come out at all, did it? Um, <laughs> is just to say that reminding people about the whys is extremely important. That telling them just once won't do the trick. We did another survey of people one year later after they watched our video, and what we found is, and we did a control group as well, our, our people that watched our video a year later were still saving a lot of animals, most of them maintained their pledges pretty closely. Uh, the people that the control group actually ate more animals over the past year. And we thought that was really weird. We assumed that in general people were kind of reporting meat reduction just because it's cool. What it was was a handful of ex-vegetarians brought up the entire uh, meat count, eating count, for the entire control group. There was not a single ex-vegetarian 
in our View the Video group, even though there was lots of people that watched as a vegetarian. So what we gleaned from that is that people who are vegetarian who watch a four minute video on this don't become ex-vegetarians, and people who are vegetarian and don't get an intervention do become ex-vegetarians. So it's not just the hows. Occasional reminding of those whys is a really effective way to ensure that people uh, stay on the issues and maybe even eventually become the budding activists uh, that we hope they're going to become. This is our youngest activist we've ever had on our pay-per-view tour. Uh, and yeah, you can clap for her. <laughs> Uh, we want people to go vegan, to know why they're vegan, and hopefully to eventually tell others why they should go vegan. Thank you very much. I'm Michael Weberman from the